Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with uh, Community Coronavirus Update number 57. Today we'll talk about the importance of getting from vaccines to vac vaccinations and explain the numbers behind herd immunity. So the um, important emphasis is that vaccines don't work until they become vaccinations. So yes, we've got vaccines, but until they get into people's arms and bodies and start working, we're not going to stop this thing. And, and vaccination rollouts are more complicated than people think. Uh, the other thing is saying, well, how many people do we have to vaccinate? And that requires us to get to something called herd immunity. It's a much misunderstood term, unfortunately, and it's a it caused uh, people to make some bad decisions, I think, in the country and the world. Actually, some people thought they could go to herd, quote, the natural way, which is a very bad idea. Uh, so it's good to understand what is behind herd immunity. And herd immunity is a threshold at which the vac the, an infection no longer spreads. And the way to calculate herd immunity is a formula, uh, usually involving vaccination, because that's the good way to get there without killing lots of people. So the formula here is right here, one minus one over R naught, which is the inherent infectiousness of the, vac of the virus, plus E, which is the, the effectiveness of the vaccine. And so what does that look like? Well, here's a, a range of infectiousnesses. So uh, most people think that uh, that coronavirus was in the two and a half to three and a half range, although it could be higher, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so depending on which are, which is the true or not, that tells you what herd immunity threshold is. It's likely in the 60 to 70% if you're thinking two and a half to three and a half. How many people you need to get vaccinated depends on how, how efficacious the vaccine is. At 95% versus 80%, you may need a very different vaccination rate. So how do you know which of those numbers are right? Um, one of the, my frustrations, like last time I, I talked about, is that Test Nebraska still has an old, outdated version of what is potentially herd immunity, 50 to 70 percent. This is wrong, and most experts don't think this is correct. Uh, I think the thing is it's misleading because it says that eventually that many people will get it. Well, no, eventually people will not get it because we're going to vaccinate them to, and save thousands of lives if we do it right. I think this is leading people to a false impression that we should go for herd immunity, which we should not do. Uh, we should, but we shouldn't do it. We should do it through vaccines. Uh, so here's a summary, and the good news is we have a lot of good vaccines, and we know what that efficacy number is. So both the Pfizer and Moderna num uh, vaccines are in the 94, 95% range. Uh, these are already approved and already being given to Nebraskans as we speak. Uh, on top of that, we have a Janssen, uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, which also appears to be roughly that uh, effective. Plus, it's potentially a one-shot, and it also doesn't need to be frozen like these others. And this could be coming out. Uh, we could have a, a phase three results in January, and it could be distributed as soon as February, potentially, and as well as Novavax potentially coming out as well. So we have a number of good candidates uh, that are highly effective. Um, the other problem, though, that you may have heard about recently is this concern about this uh, British uh, strain that could be more infectious. And actually, most people don't think it's just a British strain. It's probably already in the United States or a similar one's probably already here. We just haven't been measuring it the way the British have. Um, but essentially, it looks like the virus has probably mutated and become a little more infectious. And this is one of the concerns and one of the problems with letting vaccine, the virus spread unchecked in a population is you give it more opportunities to evolve in a bad way for us. And it looks like this has probably happened. But that's okay. We've got a way to deal with that. Um, and this Lancet article uh, that I've uh, linked to actually does explain this problem, that one of the things that policymakers have to worry about is the, the molecular evolution of the virus, meaning viruses mutate and they can potentially become more infectious, and it appears that this is what is happening right now. Uh, and so we have to account for that. Uh, and so Fauci uh, uh, was quoted uh, numerous times saying he thinks that the, that our herd immunity threshold we need to need is about 75, 80 uh, percent. It was some, sometimes maligned as a guesstimate. Well, of course it's a guess because initially we didn't have all the data we have now. And so I, one of my frustrations is I think the general public doesn't realize science changes based on the latest available best information. And so a good scientist will change their numbers as they get better data. And that's what he is doing. He's not waffling. It's not because he doesn't know what he's talking about. It's because the numbers are getting better and more refined and we have better ideas a better way to predict. And so he's saying 75, 80% is about what we need to hit, and I think he is correct. And why do I think is correct? Well, we already know that the efficacy for the vaccine we need is 90, is 95%. We've got two and potentially three vaccines that are in this range. Uh, it herd immunity, if, if the, the fears are correct and the, the uh, British strain that may be here already is 50% more infective, we'd have an R naught of three, we may actually have an R naught of 4.5. That would mean herd immunity of 77.8%, but with a 95% effective vaccine. We are in that 75, 80, 85 percent range that Fauci is talking about. And so what that means is we have to plan for a vaccination rate of 70 to 85 percent uh, if we want to get this stopped, although we could stop it faster, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Um, so the question is, can we get to the 75, 80, 85 percent vaccination? And the correct the answer is yes, and the reason I know that is because that's what I do for a living. Uh, I work as the Chief Medical Officer One Health Nebraska ACO this past four years, and prior to that I was at the Southeast Rural Physicians Alliance ACO for the last four years. 
all of Nebraska's ACOs are, are routinely vaccinating their Medicare patients for influenza in ranges of 80, 85, 90, even 95 percent. So we've done this for influenza for years. So of course we should be able to do it for coronavirus, especially if we're involved in the in the effort. Um, if for for backstory, of course, if you, uh, people may not know some of these names, but Allegiant Health is the Catholic Health Initiative's Omaha Physician Network. TPN is their non-Omaha network. Uh, Bryan Health is centered around uh, Lincoln, of course, and in our region. Midwest Health Coalition is a, is a coalition of independent doctors, kind of like One Health and Serpa, where I work. Nebraska Health Network. This is University of Nebraska, uh, Methodist, and Fremont. NPG Health is a is a network of rural uh, critical access to, uh, physicians and, uh, and hospitals. And then Think ACO is that Apple Store looking place on uh, off of about 72nd Street north of I-80. And so they regularly get in that range. Now, Medicare patients tend to be better at following directions than younger people. So are, do we do as well with younger people? Uh, and the answer is yes. So here is our latest report card from Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, where our vaccination rates in adolescents are 92, 93% from meningococcus and Tdap. And so Blue Cross Blue Shield has the exact same data on all the physician work networks. So if you're a large employer and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Nebraska is your insurer, you could actually ask them and see if they would give you this data to see how the networks are doing in your region of, or in your neck of the woods in Nebraska. So uh, one of the things I think that's missing in the state is we need the state to start working with these physician networks. And to, much to my frustration, neither the states or the public health departments are involving us in the, in the rollout yet. I hope they'll bring us in because, one, we've, we've proven that we do this because this is literally what we do for a living. Uh, also, we have access to the prioritization data we're going to need in subsequent phases. And so we want to prioritize people with diabetes and heart disease. Well, some of those other measures we are measuring are actually our control of our patients with diabetes and heart disease. So we have the data to reach out to all those patients and make sure that they get in so we can get them vaccinated. Uh, the other reason is because vaccine hesitancy and resistance studies show that primary care doctors are the physician are the people that the general public trusts most on whether they should get vaccinated or not. And so involving the primary care doctors, the family physicians, the pediatricians, OBGYNs, internal medicine doctors, they will be the best at carrying the message to patients to make sure, make sure that we get them vaccinated at a sufficient rate. I think uh, one of the things, the biggest things that saved our hospitals from being overwhelmed was the fact that a lot of doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists from the hospitals went directly to the public and started putting out PSAs, Facebook posts, everything, trying to get people uh, to pay attention and to do the right thing. And I think this was probably our most effective communication strategy was getting all these folks. So credit to Nebraska Medicine and Brian Health and a, a lot of other primary care doctors putting this message out and, and on their social media feeds and everybody else, because I think this convinced more people to do the right than anything than anything else. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we need data. We need what gets measured gets managed and what gets managed gets done. And so, like I said, these uh, physician networks, they've got the data. They know how to manage this kind of thing. Uh, I think it would help if the state would also, also put this data out there. Uh, and so, for example, in influenza vaccination rates, we've been working on this for years to try and improve these rates. Unfortunately, Nebraska has some of the worst worst urban rural health disparities in the country. Uh, so here is, for example, is a public health district map of influenza vaccinations as low as 33, 33, 34% in northern Nebraska, but as high as 71, 72% uh, in the urban areas. And so we have, we need to make this better. We should be doing the same thing with coronavirus and we could track this. Uh, there, Nebraska does have a state immunization information system so they could track the vaccination rates of everybody and they should say they should be updating this as well. Uh, you can actually go here into the, to this information system, look up your own vaccines. Uh, this is actually mine, by the way. So I looked up mine and they do have my last flu shot uh, here that I received a few months ago, my last tetanus shot, for example. Uh, physician I know, I looked, uh, she will let me look her up and here's her COVID-19 vaccine she got 11 days ago. So we know that coronavirus vaccine is in the state immunization system, so they should be able to create a map like this, uh, I think that would be good. Uh, we need better accountability. We need less partisanship and more accountability. That means acknowledging reality, owning it, and finding solutions. And so I hope our, uh, the, that's what we'll start seeing in 2021 from our politicians and our leaders. Uh, and then we should put that data out there so everybody can see, and we can use that to generate some positive con uh, competition amongst the health department districts, because the faster we get the people vaccinated at these rates, the faster we get past this dang thing. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is it's not there's yet one more variable, uh, and this is a study I talked about a few weeks ago from Rochelle Walensky and a, a couple of others, and the good news is she is actually the incoming CDC director, so she knows her stuff, basically. Uh, and so one of the things they, they talk about, it's not just the effectiveness of the vaccine, it's also uh, putting in place effective uh, measures to slow spread. 
so basically the, what the, the gist of the article is the fastest route to normal is, is vaccinations plus showing spread. And so there's two numbers. R0 is the inherent infectiousness of a virus. RT is the effective infectiousness given current mitigation measures. And so this R0 is not set in stone. We can actually change that infectiousness based on what we do and how we behave. Uh, one of those ways to do that is to wear a mask. And when you wear masks and do these other things, you actually move from an a inherent infectiousness of R0 to an effective infectiousness, which can be halved. And if we cut, inherent infe we cut that infection and transmission by half, it means our herd humidity threshold will be much lower, which means the, the vaccination rate that we need to get this thing to start fizzing out even faster is also halved. And so, for example, once we start getting 35, 45% of people vaccinated, we could have this virus transmission uh, stop really fast. If we could just get people to behave just a little bit longer, wear their masks, do the right thing, we could be past this thing within months. Um, uh, the good news is we've made some progress since we almost overwhelmed our hospitals. We have dropped our transmission quite a bit. However, there's some issues here. Number one is that uh, our positive test rate is still really high, which means these numbers are probably falsely low. They're probably higher than that because not enough people are getting tested. So there's some concern there. Uh, the other thing that worries me is this uh, the sudden uh, opening back up too fast. And the way I describe it, it's like driving down the interstate, you hit a patch of ice and you start sliding out of control because you were driving a little too fast. Well, when you gain control, you won't want to speed back up again to 75 and put the cruise control on. You want to drive a little slower. Uh, but essentially what our state keeps doing over and over again, as soon as we get a slight improvement, they start opening things back up again way too fast. It's like being on an icy road and just putting it right up to, back to 75 on the cruise control again. And we need to quit doing that. Um, you know, the numbers are pretty uh, conclusive that we need to keep restaurant capacity, for example, at a much lower rate and going all the way up to 75% capacity does almost nothing to prevent spread. We need to have it lower than 50% if we want to make a big impact. And some of the things we keep making the same mistakes over and over again, which is driving me crazy. Um, you know, at the end of the day, who got it right? It's how many dead people did you get at the end? And here's again, like I've uh, been saying for the last couple of weeks, we know who's done it best across the country. Maine is probably our poster child for doing the right thing. But even in Nebraska, we know that Lancaster County's fatality rate is about half of what the rest of Nebraska is because we do have a little more res restrictive measures on, on restaurant capacity, for example. Our numbers speak for themselves. If the Nebraska, if the state of Nebraska had adopted the same strategy as Maine, we'd have over a thousand fewer dead Nebraskans right now. Or if we did at least did what Lincoln did, we have about 700 fewer Nebraskans right now. And like I say, at the end of the day, who's right? Who had the less deaths? Uh, and if Lincoln, you know, if our congressional district was like Lincoln, we'd only have about 300 deaths, which is about anywhere from a half to a quarter of all these other congressional districts around us that adopted that kind of crazy, we're just going to go for her naturally mentality. Well, they killed off, you know, two to four times as many people as Lincoln did by doing that, which was a bad idea. Uh, so my goal for the, my hope for 2021, let's keep Nebraska deaths below 2000. We can do that. We know how to do it literally. Uh, and how do we get there? Well, light it in a tunnel. We know herd immunity now is probably 70 to 85%. If we do a good job ruling out these vaccines and limiting spread by getting people to wear some masks, we could one, keep Nebraska deaths less than 2000, but we could also get to normal by summer. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick of this as well. So let's get to it and uh, let's uh, please wear a mask. Please get your vaccine. Uh, and I'll probably record another one of these next week talking about, I think we'll talk more next week about things like vaccine logistics, tiers, travel, things like that. Hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, usually a disclaimer that these are my opinions, not necessarily those of the where I where I work and who I work for, but just to know this is where I am and you can find the all the past videos at healthylincoln.org or just uh, going to the Bob Browner YouTube.